Let's come back to Ephesians, the second chapter. We're almost finished this chapter now. Just like that high fake for our last study period for the second of time. And um, once again, take a quick look at the purpose of the sanctuary that God has spoken to to build in such detail. And um, that, that building was designed to be a picture of what God designed the folk themselves to be upon this earth. And also a picture of the incarnation of Jesus Christ. So we have the earthly building made of earthly materials, which would pass away. So the human body temple likewise is built as that temple was. And so is the, so is the body of Christ. And let's turn to the Zion of Ages for a moment to uh, note that beautiful statement in regard to the sanctuary being the picture of Jesus Christ and an incarnation. This is what we're going to book about page, uh, see now that page 21 or 30. Chapter called God with us, page 23 actually. So, so I'd like to read the last paragraph on page 23, for God commanded Moses for Israel. God commanded Moses for Israel, let them make me a dwelling place for them, and let them make me a dwelling place for them, and let them and he abode in the sanctuary in the midst of his people through all their weary wandering in the desert. The symbol of his presence was with them. So Christ set out his tabernacle in the midst of our human encampment. He pitched his tent by the side of the tent of men that he might dwell among us and make us familiar with his divine character and life. The word became flesh and tabernacled among us, and we beheld his glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. Thank you very much. Now, first of all, Sister White talks about the Old Testament sanctuary being the abode of God in the midst of his people. And then she says, So Christ set up his tabernacle and Mr. Father in camp, and he pitched his tent outside the tents of men. So this sanctuary is a picture of both of the human temple that we possess and also the human temple that Jesus Christ likewise possessed. And in this building, which is entirely of this earth, God's presence came. So we have perfection and imperfection, divinity and humanity, pictured there and also revealed here. Now the building then is a picture of what God's folk are to be. There, the building itself is a picture of what God's folk themselves are to be. What about the services? They tell us how to achieve that. They're the means of achieving the divine objective or the, the divine ideal. So if we were deprived of the way to achieve, what would, what would the sanctuary be to us? A great discouragement, wasn't it? A very disheartening, frustrating, discouraging picture indeed. So God has given us that service, both the design of what we are to be and the prestige of what we are to achieve that worthwhile objective. Back now to Ephesians, the second, second chapter, and we'll read verses 19 to 22, please. Now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building, being fitted together, grows into a holy temple of the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. Thank you very much. Now... First of all, Paul says, no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens of the saints and members of the household of God. Paul seems to love this uh, thought that we are members of the household of God. He keeps repeating it, does he not, as we go through these various pages or verses, verses in this chapter. And Paul saw us not merely as adherents to the faith, but as actual members of the family, part of the body of Jesus Christ, fellow citizens, and fellow heirs with Christ in that kingdom. He picked up the thought Christ said in the Lord's Prayer, called God our Father. And it's a very beautiful assurance and reassurance again and again of the relationship which is sustained between God and his true people. Then he moves on to talk about the temple which is being built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in the whole building being joined together goes into the holy temple of the Lord in whom you also are being put together for a habitation of God in the Spirit. First of all, I wonder why we're referred to the foundation being the apostles and the prophets, and where else in the Bible is the same picture given? Turn to Revelation chapter 22 and 23, and we'll read there about the Holy 
city, the New Jerusalem, and find that the foundations are walls and foundations are that of the uh, apostles and prophets. Uh, Galatians 21, verse 14, first of all. And the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and in them the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. Thank you very much. So the foundation of the New Jerusalem contains the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb, which are Peter, James, and John, his brethren, including Paul. And what about the twelve uh, gates? There's and had a great um, and uh, had a wall great and high and had twelve gates and at the gates twelve angels and the names written thereon which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel and why do you suppose that uh, the city of God has the names of the, of the, of the tribes and the gates and of the apostles upon the foundations what point is there in that about that? Um, sure. We find that the 12 tribes' names are described at the gates and the 12 apostles in the foundation of New Jerusalem. Why is this? We know that names are character. That's right, the character. Because of the tribes in particular, of course, also the apostles. Right? Now let's pick this up in the foundations of the building. Which part of the building is laid first? Foundations. foundations. And upon them is built a superstructure right to the very roof until it's finished. If the foundations are sound, the building then of course can be built soundly on top of those foundations. It can also be built wrongly too. And the revelations of truth, the build of the Christian experience down to the ages has been progressive from one place to the other and the foundation laid far, far back in the very beginning. And every time that God spoke recovered truth, they do so progressively better, progressively beyond what was learned previously. <coughs> now certainly, of course, during the apostolic period, the revelation of truth reached a very high pitch, a very, very wonderful uh, uh, scope, and was lost to the great apostasy to a large extent. But when the Advent, or first of all, I should say the Reformers, when the Reformers came on the scene, what did they, what, what did they do? They built a building in the past. They recovered and rebuilt what had been built previously as a foundation for the final work in these last days. And I was quite impressed as I read in this from Reformation Quest by Andy James and the Reformers to see how they've been understood the principles of the divine order and government and the gospel, the basic gospel, so clearly and so plainly and so well. Who do you regard as being the very first of the great reformers? Right, John Wycliffe, followed by us in German Bohemia and Luther in Germany. I admire those men, of course, because they love the truth so, so dearly they were prepared to give their lives, but many of them did. I wonder if I'd be prepared to give my life for the truth that came to facing martyrdom. One can't tell, of course, that I'm actually coming before us. Those men were men with, with quite fine minds and more importantly, of course, were led by the Spirit of God to understand the truths of the Gospel and taught those, those truths fearlessly and, and well. So in these last days, we are to recover all the truths of all time. Yeah. I was just question on the Reformers. Some of them seem to fail in accepting all the truths, like Luther had the Sabbath truths brought to but he couldn't see it. I guess he's not held accountable as far as I understand. Well, only God can judge, of course, in that respect. Right. But uh, I have read some writers who say that Luther's last day were not to be compared to his first day, is that he was, went back badly in spirit and attitude and practice and so forth. Okay. So it could be that he did reject the right of his salvation. Could be that. But time later will tell him time that we might come to the kingdom, of course, and that for sure. But naturally, of course, the person advances so far and the truth falls back at that point, he undoes all the good things that are before, doesn't he? Right. So then, um, we today have very precious truths that have not been taught before, or don't, don't seem to be taught before, and but we must give credit, of course, to what's been done in the past. Now, when the 
the Adventist Church arose back, or first of all, the Adventist Church arose back in 1831, 32, under the ministry. Uh, they were building on the foundations laid by the Great Apology of Paul, and they didn't start from nothing. They started, they had, they had, a, they had a jump start or a flying start based upon that work done previously. And in turn, the Adventist Church itself then built further on that in, under the Third Angel's message in 1844. I used to marvel at Uriah's this book and thought to myself, how did this man put all this together? So I realised, of course, later that he had drawn heavily from the revelation given by men of God previous to him. <coughs> so the building goes forward stage by stage, block by block, stone by stone, until it's completely finished. Now, in a building, is every stone the same? No. Uh, you find many stones the same, but not all. <coughs> Some have special purposes, such as cornerstones, towers, buttresses, uh, and so on, while others are, are just uh, war standards that are, are, are fairly common. And likewise, do you find in the Christian church that every person is a proper standard of every other person? No. No, we're all different. Each person occupying the position assigned to him by the architect, who, of course, is God himself. Now, this is a growing building in whom the whole building being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. So it grows block by block, by block, stone by stone. Is the building yet finished? No. Is all truth been discovered yet? No. Has the last person been saved yet? Not yet. So the building is still growing and will grow into a fantastic structure in the end. Now, as we look back upon the past, we, we, we seem to see a picture of minimal results of the gospel. We seem to see a picture of very few people being saved. At the present time throughout the whole wide world, how many folk really understand the gospel that we can say? Very, very few. Very, very few indeed. And therefore, the building looks like being a little a little structure of no great size whatsoever. So I'll read at least one statement which, which does give a different picture than that altogether. In the book Great Controversy, I think I can find it. Uh, again, we looked at this just the other day, I think. This gives a picture of a mighty army of literally tens of thousands of people who come forth in their graves to welcome the Lord when he returns. Uh, it's somewhere about page 646 or thereabouts, I do believe. Yeah, page 644 to be precise. Amid the reeling of the earth, the face of lightning and the roar of thunder, etc. Amid the reeling of the earth, the flash of lightning and the roar of thunder, the voice of the Son of God calls forth the sleeping saints. He looks upon the graves of the righteous, then raising his hands to heaven, he cries, Awake, 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 ye that sleep in the dust, and arise. Throughout the length and breadth of the earth, the dead shall hear that voice and they that hear shall live, and the whole earth shall ring with the tread of the exceeding great army of every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. Thank you. Well, read the, you read the rest. From the prison house of death they come, clothed with immortal, immortal glory, crying, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? 1 Corinthians 15.55 And the living righteous and the risen saints unite their voices in a long, glad shout of victory. Thank you. Now it talks here of an exceeding great army of every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. Does this look like a small and meager result of the gospel? No, it doesn't. And some of us in the does say that if the gospel will not achieve meager results, it will be rather a glorious and triumphant conclusion when it's finally brought to its consummation. Now, can we at the present time locate, a num locate every believer in number of Israel? That's quite impossible. And obviously, of course, there must be a very large number of people hidden away from our side who are indeed true Christians. It must be. I'm glad to know that there is such a large company of people. In fact, Sister White says that the majority of God's true faith they found where? Mostly forming churches. And why does God not labor the present time to bring us together with them? We're not ready to give them what they need. Exactly right. We are too divided and. Uh, have too many different views amongst us, and so we'll to recommend this to the people out there in the world who are simple Christians following the Lord Jesus Christ. But the time is soon coming, of course, when the mighty midnight call will sound again, the latter rain will fall, and the fourth angel shall 
can we hold his body down when that time comes? What will happen to these people? I hear the cry come out of them like people. They join with God's remnant, and then we'll see the army swell to tremendous proportions. They have to have the and bounce and convert a single day. So the building is much larger, much stronger, much more beautiful than the rest of the time realize. Now, this building is built together for habitation of God in the Spirit. Are we talking about literal stones, a literal physical building? No. Does the Spirit of God habitate that kind of structure? No, He doesn't. Where does the Spirit of God dwell? In us. Right. In the believers, in, in the church, in the family of God. And so we're all being built together for, for habitation of God in the Spirit. A living, a living building of human beings and saved people who provide the Spirit of God with His abiding place in that great day which is soon to come. So let's be eternally grateful then for the great work done by those who have gone before us, the foundation of land, the structure which has been built so far, and for the vast army of saved people, both dead and alive, who will meet the Savior and come to the clouds of heaven. Now, chapter 3 begins the study of the mystery of God, one of my favorite scriptures, in fact. And uh, that might be revelation of the special ministry of Paul, <coughs> this work which he was called to accomplish. And bear in mind, of course, that Paul was a champion of this theme. So was A.D. Jones. Jones loved to preach about this. And it's one of my favorite themes as well. It's one of my favorite themes. And uh, because Paul, and even John the Apostle as well, before in particular was commissioned to proclaim the mystery of God, he, he was the man with the key in his hand to preserve the future of the church. And therefore Satan's special target to be broken down and become unfaithful to his, to his commission. And tragically, of course, we know he did, he did fail in the end by going to Jerusalem to offer that sacrifice. And thus, and thus the church lost its champion as Paul put away the prison. And the enemies of the mystery of God were strengthened through a whole mystery of iniquity. And the foundations for the papacy were, were so strongly laid. Now, if today we fail, as Paul failed back there, what shall happen to the future of God's church? The same result precisely. Now, I'm sure that if Paul could have, or had, I shouldn't say could have, because I'm sure he could have, if he had sat there and thought carefully through the results of his course of action, he would have never made the mistake he made. And when we get to heaven, Paul looks back on the result, or then see the results of that mistake would be of Paul at what his mistake caused in after years. You know, a seed sown doesn't amount to very much at the present time, but as time goes by and the, the, the mighty tree grows, it becomes a very significant factor in our, in, in, in our history. So let's read first of all chapter 3, verses 1 down to 7, shall we? For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which was given to me for you, how that by revelation he made known to me the mystery, as I have briefly written already, by which when you read you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of this promise of Christ the gospel, of which I became a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given to me by the effective work of his power. Now, Paul was very uninhibited, wasn't he? He didn't uh, hesitate to make claims for his own ministry, to declare precisely who he was. It wasn't an act of pride, an act of fact that he, or a factual presentation that he made. But he didn't hesitate to declare who he was, did he? Did he? No. no. Right. Now let's read verse 1. For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles, the prisoner of Jesus Christ. Now, was Paul a prisoner of Jesus Christ? Yes. At least in some sense. <clears throat> right. If he wasn't what he said he was. So therefore he certainly was a prisoner of Jesus Christ. Spiritual prisoner. Yes, yeah, a spiritual prisoner, also, also physical, but not in the sense of being locked up in a, in a cage or locked up in a, in a prison cell. This is his desire to be that servant. Yeah. He was president and he was called to fulfill a certain mission and he had an option to fulfill that mission. Now when God chooses to call a person to a certain post of duty, 
in fact, every one of us is called to some place of duty at the present time and in the future as well. If that person should refuse that call, then what does he do to himself? He cuts himself off from eternal life. Take, for instance, Foss and Poy back at the turn, turn of the middle of the last century near the great event uh, movement, when those two men refused to be the prophet, both of them lost their eternal life and uh, cannot be saved. But this seems like a very arbitrary, almost harsh judgment on God's part, doesn't it? Doesn't it? Surely, surely there's a choice left for us to either be a prophet or not be a prophet. Can't we choose? Right, we have the freedom to choose. But if we refuse, the penalty is loss of eternal life. So is that real freedom? We can choose to die. <coughs> we I sure can. Why, uh, one could say if they refuse the position of being a prophet, but still would just be a very ordinary Christian. Right? That's my question. Yeah. Well, if you choose to be your own uh, decision maker, then you are putting your place in yourself in God's place, and you're. But that is that's the right that's procedure. That's yeah. all these self God. But that's true. But none of us are really working out for our capacity. Not we are by the fact that we choose our sin and so on. Are not doing the work that we should be doing. And so, in a sense, we're doing the same thing. If you know what. We should be giving them out. Yeah. That's quite, quite so good. We're choosing uh, at this moment by taking our time and being slow. If we are refusing our commission, which we. Not refusing, not refusing the commission. Well, in a sense. In a sense. Well, we're talking about quite badly, but at least we're doing our work. Well, is, that's what I mean. Why couldn't that person say, instead of being a particular apostle, just be an ordinary uh, Joe Blow? That's all I'm saying. Because he's refusing his appointment. Yeah. Whereas the other person is doing four jobs at the point, if he's doing his appointment. Okay. Now, why did Foster and Poet use their position? Because of unbelief, because of a spirit that denied self sacrifice. So, therefore, they denied the gospel of Jesus Christ. They are working in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And by so doing, they cut themselves off the eternal life. God didn't cut them off at the moment, did he? He wasn't God's sentence. He wasn't God's arbitrary act. He offered them. He called into that position in both cases, and in both cases they refused to occupy the position because it was cost of hardship and suffering and pain and so forth. Um, I'm just trying to think of a specific person who grew back because of uh, no, excuse me, the self-sacrifice. It was a Bible character again. The rich and is a good example of that. Now, when let me say it again, when God calls you to a position, be it large or small as the case may be, that will obviously result in persecution, it will, it will result in sacrifice, it will result in pain, loss and so forth. And if you find yourself unable to bear that kind of price or cost and you refuse to take up the work, then you're refusing the very principle of the gospel itself. You're refusing to sacrifice self in exchange for service. And when you refuse to do that, then you're refusing the gospel and you're cutting yourself off from eternal life. But God isn't doing it at all. Right. Now, when the Lord came to Paul on the Damascus Road and showed me out the word about his conversion and called him to be a, a minister to the Gentiles, Paul must have seen beforehand something at least what, what, they, would, what they would bring to him. He, he, he'd not been a persecutor, a slave of Christians. He'd seen the fate of uh, Stephen the first martyr. And Paul had no misgiving no, no mis to what his future would be likewise. And therefore, he had to make the choice in the face of that rather dismal prospects for the future. But he made it, gladly made it. Now, Paul knew that he couldn't, he couldn't turn back from that, that uh, condition without losing eternal life. And so, therefore, he was a prisoner of Jesus Christ because it was a case of serve Christ or perish, wasn't it? And that prospect was enough to keep him from turning the wrong direction. It reminds me of the soul of little Bippin after the being of the 5,000 and the great crowd pushed up Christ and, and uh, Christ said to them, will you also go away, what they say? Which we go? What's the alternative? It was rather a dismal prospect and they felt they couldn't uh, accept the alternative, so they best stay with Christ as a lesser of the two evils. <laughs> yes, Frank? Right. Doesn't that seem to, though, uh, raise the... the possible question that um, 
Satan could go before God and say, well, look at these people. They're just serving you because they know that if they don't, they'll lose their eternal life. Well, true, that's the only value for serving Christ at this time than us. But at the same time, it's an awareness that every true servant of God feels as well. Because there comes a time when every person God's ever called to come to you discouraged, as Elijah did, and those who did, until the Baptist did the sign. That's just what uh, Satan tried to say about Job and what yeah. God went through to expose that as a false <coughs> Yeah. There's no man of God or woman of God that ever that never becomes discouraged or, or, or never become, no, I should say, never become discouraged. We all do. And when we do, of course, we tend to commit sin. And in that diet and trying, yeah, we feel like giving up, but, but God says, no, you can't, because the cost of giving up, of course, is to lose eternal life. So Paul was, in fact, a prisoner of Jesus Christ, constrained <coughs> by this awareness, but also more particularly constrained by his tremendous love for the Gentile people and for the Church of God in general and for the cause of Christ and the of Christ himself. So the real imprisonment was, was, was a compulsion of love, was it not? It was a real imprisonment as far as Paul was concerned. He, he deeply loved God and Jesus Christ and also every individual who needed, to, needed salvation for them, like any sacrifice who needed to bring about their salvation. So Paul was a prisoner of Jesus Christ from several, several angles or points of view. Now he says, verse 2, If indeed you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which was given, me to, given to me for you. Now comes this word dispensation again. And this time more particularly it doesn't mean a period of time so much as, as an actual endowment or gift or outpouring or, or giving. This gift of grace, of the grace of God, which was given to me for you. Now Paul says, I have been especially commissioned to serve the needs of which class of people? Gentiles. The Gentiles, right? Peter, more particularly for the Jews, but, jo- but Paul for the Gentiles. Now, I wonder why Paul was chosen of God to work for the Gentiles. Was well, something about his past experience in training which, which fitted in for that, particularly? His education. His education. Well, his Tarsus, all the Tarsus was not. Yes. That was not uh, a city of Jerusalem. <coughs> no, it is. It was a Roman city. It was a Roman city. Not, not, not as early, but in, but in, in age five, I think. Yeah. Pardon? Yeah. Yes. He was well versed in Jewish law because he'd been a Pharisee. At the same time, he was highly educated in the Roman schools and so on, and mingled with the generals, understood their thinking and their ways of working and whatnot, and therefore could best meet their needs and did best meet the needs of all the apostles. So that there was given him a special dispensation of the grace of God, which was given to me for you. Now, all God's biddings are what? Amen. Enabling. So if God gives you a commission to do a certain work, then He'll give you all the enablings needed to give to, to do that particular work. So do we find that Paul received every gift needed in his life to meet the needs of the Gentile world? We certainly do. We have the gift of healing, the gift of discernment, the uh, gift of love. The gift of education, the gift of experience, what he needed to meet the needs of those people, and the special revelation of the mystery of God, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Colossians 1, verse 27 tells us that point. Now, verse 3, if you want to read it, please. 3, verse 3. How that by revelation he made known to me the mystery, as I have briefly written already. What do you have to Okay, you can change. You can change. Yeah. This is on my mind. Ephesians 3.3. That's right. Mine says how that uh, revelation made known to me the mystery. Mm-hmm. Yes, I wrote as far as the fourth year in a few words. Mm-hmm. 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 Oh, wait, mine doesn't have to be premature on it. It's a marked up one. That's the point then. Uh, yeah. How yeah. that's our revelation that you may know the mysteries I read before in a few words, but which when you read, you may understand why knowledge of the mystery of Christ. So, by what means did Paul receive the revelation of the mystery of Christ? The by what means did Paul receive the revelation of the mystery of Christ? By revelation. 
Okay. Now, in fact, there's no other way to receive that knowledge, is there? Because because Christianity is a revealed religion. It's not something we've been put together. When you think of the grand and glorious themes in the Bible and the spirit of prophecy, you ask yourself, how could Sister White herself ever, or the Bible authors in regard to the Bible, Sister White in regard to spirit of prophecy, how could those Bible authors have ever from themselves put together such glorious truths? Was it possible? How could Sister White have ever written those words from herself? Could she have done it? No. When, when God comes down through his chain of command to reveal to his messenger these truths, then of course the writing will bear the divine likeness and there's a perfect consistency in how which goes for and become, they become an authority, a reliable authority upon which we can rest in these times. In just the same way, Paul received the revelation of the mystery of God by revelation, not by tutorship, but by revelation the nature of God himself. And therefore, we know this is the actual word of God from God himself through the Apostle Paul to us in turn. In verse 5, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it has never been revealed by the Spirit through his holy apostles and prophets. So this idea of progressive truth is brought to you again in this particular reference. As we find that uh, in the days of Paul, the knowledge of the mystery of his far advanced that which has been known to the holy apostles and prophets in the past. You should say the sons of men rather, because now they know the holy apostles and prophets in the present. Now how far back do we go in talking about a lesser knowledge of the mystery of God that was known in Paul's day? How far, how far back do we go? Eternally. Right? Now, of course, eternally there was in the, in the eternity of the past there was only three: the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. <coughs> and somewhere back there came the creation of the first angels. How far back? Can you tell? No, it must be a long, long time. At least some millions of years, I would expect. Maybe trillions of years back then in the past. And uh, in that time, a way, way back there, the um, mystery God was not understood by the angels as it was now understood by Paul and the apostles and prophets of his time. Let's go back to Patriarch and Prophets and page 36 to uh, read a point in time when uh, this mystery was revealed more so than even prior to that point in time, but still not as much as in Paul's day. 36 in the book Patriarchs and Prophets. Now Satan had begun to skulk around heaven, teaching those who are listening these ideas and theories, as Satan always does, secretly seeking to undermine the authority of God, while claiming to be supportive of its best interests. His main purpose, of course, was to elevate itself and to get God to put into a new position. Let's read Show on page 36 of a little paragraph called To Dispute the Supremacy of the Son of God, thus in teaching. To dispute the supremacy of the Son of, the Son of God, thus in teaching the wisdom and love of the Creator, had become the purpose of this Prince of Angels. To this object, he was about to bend the energies of that mastermind which, next to Christ's, was first among the hosts of God. But he, who would have all the will of all his creatures free, left none unguarded to the bewildering sophistry by which rebellion would seek to justify itself. Before the great contest should open, all were to have a clear presentation of his will, whose wisdom and goodness were the spring of all their joy. Thank you. Now, to the students, please remember the Son of God, thus in teaching the wisdom of the Creator and become the purpose of this Prince of Angels. Now, think back to our first presentation this week and what was Satan aiming to achieve in this contest? To change something, to change what? Change to change God, right. To impeach God, in other words, to question his wisdom and love, 
and to call for a change in God's character and behaviour, a change which would accommodate Satan where he thought he ought to be. Now this uh, was a direct attack upon the mystery of God, which mystery was the fact that Jesus Christ was the Son of God and was both God and creature or God and angel at the same point of time. Now can we be sure that God was in fact an angel as well as being God at this point of time? Sure, no question about that. Because what is the kind of purpose of God purposed in Jesus Christ? He was an eternal purpose, right? It's right in this third chapter we're told about, the third chapter of the book of Ephesians, we're told of an eternal purpose. Uh, verse 11, want to read it for me, please? Ephesians 3 11. According to the eternal purpose, which you purpose in Christ Jesus Christ. Right. The eternal purpose. I ask you, when does the eternal purpose begin? Eternity. It doesn't begin. It's always there, isn't it? It's eternally there. When, when does it end? Eternally there is what? It never ends. It never begins to end because it's eternal. It doesn't have a starting point nor an ending point, does it? Otherwise, less than eternal. It has a starting point. So that, uh, and of course, don't ask me to explain how we can have an eternal presence of God in the past and beyond my comprehension of yours as well. But I do know that the fact of the case to know that God was eternally pre existent, He had to be for the rest of His own existence. <coughs> now, last time we heard some of the marvelous and mind boggling details of our, of our universe, of which God, of course, is the author. Now, when God spoke, energy passed out of him, flowed forth from him, and God then changed that, that, that sound into matter, so that every world actually came forth from God himself. And God created the entire universe without, without, from, from himself, without himself being in the least bit uh, diminished or, or, or depleted. So I'm God, isn't he? You think about it. Now, by virtue of his capacity to create an entire universe from within himself, he, he has to be at a great distance from the tiny creature that, that is only a small part of one small corner of a great universe. And therefore some, some communication must be set up to in order to reach us. Otherwise we we're too far distant from God. And Jesus Christ is a communicator. So on the one side, Jesus Christ is God entirely and totally. He can reach God for himself and by himself. On the other side, what, what is he? Creature. First of all, an angel and later than a man. Because Christ became the begotten Son of God twice. First of all, somewhere back in the eternity of the past, and the second case, of course, in in, uh, in Bethlehem, he became a, a Son of God and Son of Man. Now, it was not against God that Satan was mounting his attack, but against him, the Son of God, which is Jesus Christ. And as sure as, sure as he attacked the position of Christ, he attacked the mystery of God, because Christ was God in the flesh. It was, it was God in you, the hope of glory. Now, that presence of God in the creature back there was just as much the hope of glory as then, even though they're not lost yet, as it is today. Because their future glory, or, or their hope and future glory, dependent upon Christ being in the creature to unite the Father and the child. Now, when this challenge was mounted by Satan against the mystery of God, God summoned the heavenly host before him, that in their presence he might set forth the true position of his Son, and shall relationally sustain to all created beings. I want to read that paragraph, please. The King of the Universe summoned the heavenly host. The King of the Universe summoned the heavenly hosts before him, that in their presence he might set forth the true position of his Son, and show the relation he sustained to all created beings. The Son of God shared the Father's throne and the glory of the eternal, self-existent one encircled both. About the throne gathered the holy angels, a vast, unnumbered throne, 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. Revelation 5, verse 11. And the most exalted angels as ministers and subjects rejoicing in the light that fell upon them from the presence of deity. Before the assembled inhabitants of heaven, the king declared that none but Christ 
the only begotten of God, could ever fully enter into his purposes. And to him it was committed to execute the mighty counsels of his will. The Son of God had wrought the Father's will in the creation of all the hosts of heaven, and to him as well as to God, their homage and allegiance were due. Christ was still to exercise divine power in the creation of the earth and its, and its inhabitants, but in all this he could not seek power, excuse me, he would not seek power or exaltation for himself, contrary to God's plan, but would exalt the Father's glory and execute his purposes of beneficence and love. Thank you very much. And this is the first great sermon apparently on the mystery of God, in which, in which God set forth the true position of his Son and showed the relation he sustained to all created beings. Now you'd think, you'd think it would be a very simple task to perform on God's part, for him to explain to the angels how Jesus Christ was in fact God at the same time angel. That shouldn't be very hard to do, should it? If we understand that today quite nicely. We have no doubts about Christ being God doing or angel doing. So why couldn't Satan see it? Why couldn't he see it? Why couldn't he see it? He had a But he wasn't. Yes. Where did he get that preconception from? From his own side. That's right. Yes, that's right. And once, once, pardon. I didn't hear what she said. I heard his noise. I didn't hear what Linda said. He wanted that position for himself, so blinding him. Right. Now, once pride fixed in the heart of Satan, or Lucifer, as he was still being called, blindness followed, did it not? And he, he could not see his deviation from the truth. And, 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 one second. No matter how, how plainly it was shown to him, the clearest evidence would mean nothing to him whatsoever, right? His mind was perverted, he lost the power to see, and therefore nothing would prove anything to him accepting what he wanted to see in his own world of error and uh, truth. Yeah. Yes, Gina. I feel that so totally was Christ angel, and so humble was Christ, that all the same could see was another angel there, and a humble one without any pride, without taking any glory on himself. He said, he's like me. Sure. Exactly. That's just nice to write, but you know the Christ was uh, such that he didn't, didn't display his divine power and work for them. Great Controversy 593, it says that we cannot represent God in so many words um, until we can have a proper conception of his purposes, his government, and his character. Now, there was a, another witness to that, and I read it, and I cannot remember where I read it, but it said it slightly different. Behold your God, that same statement. Yeah, but, but it, was, it had to do with... God's character, no, God's government, the phrase was God's government, his character, and the promises. Now, I have not been able to find that for some time, and it's been bugging me. And I've even looked in all the concordances and all, in both the back the of all the books, and I cannot find it. If anybody finds it, please let me know. We shall have the promise. Any other questions? Stay closing in the joint.